Hi, welcome to Head Start, the podcast for race directors and the business of putting on races. Running USA's annual Global Runner Survey has always been an important gauge of runner attitudes and trends for the endurance events industry. And in 2024, following some key content additions, the report is more valuable than ever. So, how can you leverage runners' fitness and social habits to increase the reach of your event? What is it that runners really value in a race? And how can you remove obstacles holding back your race's growth from its full potential? Well, that's what we're discussing today, alongside a plethora of interesting data points from the 2024 Global Runner Survey, with the help of my guest, Running USA Director of Operations, Michael Clemens. Michael, soon to be Dr. Clemens, PhD, is an endurance events man through and through, having held various roles in the industry in a career spanning over a decade. And in his latest role at Running USA, has been responsible not only for Running USA's marquee industry conference, but also all pieces of Running USA research, including the Global Runner Survey. And with his help, we'll navigate the most important findings of the report, tracking annual trends in runner habits and preferences as they evolve over time, as well as trying to make sense of what the numbers mean for your race in terms of concrete, actionable takeaways. And before we get into this great discussion, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the amazing sponsors supporting this podcast. Many thanks to Run Sign Up, Race Director's favorite all in one technology solution for endurance and fundraising events, now powering more than 28,000 in person, virtual, and hybrid events. And many thanks to Brooksy, the timing technology industry leader, bringing affordable real time tracking and timing checkpoints to races with their patented micro checkpoints. Two great companies we'll be hearing a bit more from later in the podcast. But now, let's dive into our discussion on the 2024 Global Runner Survey with Michael Clemens. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Hello, happy to be here. Well, thank you very much for uh, making the time to join me uh, today. Where does the podcast find you? So I am based in Louisville, Kentucky, grew up here, born and raised here. Um, it's been a great home base for me. So I am working from home from my house in, in Kentucky. Awesome. And you are the director of operations at uh, Running USA, fairly uh, recently christened, I guess, director of operations. Is that right? Yes. I, I took the position full time back in December of 2023. Okay. And it was actually, there was um, the, the CEO of Running USA also sort of took the helm at around that time, didn't they? Yes. Jay, Jay Holder, our new executive director, started actually a week before me. So I was his, his first order of business when he took over as executive director was hiring me full time as the, the director of operations. So we both started right. He was right after Thanksgiving. I was right in early December. Okay, so not even a year in the role then. No, yeah, we are coming up on a year. We've we've accomplished a lot in the last year though. So it feels like we've been doing it for a lot longer and we've both been in the industry for a long time. So it's been uh, a quick transition into our new roles with Running USA. You mentioned you went into the role full time. Either you or Jay, were you involved with Running USA before? I guess beyond just being members of the organization? Yes, yeah, so I've I've been uh, uh, a member of Running USA in in the past, and was actually on the board of directors for of Running USA. Um, was was elected or nominated to be on the board in 2023, and then when the director of operations role come, came open, uh, kind of offered up my services to just support the conference to make sure that everything moved forward um, in a contracted role just when the director of operations left to make sure kind of things didn't, didn't kind of lose focus or lose steam and then came on full time once Jay was hired full time. Great. I mean, I have to say as an outsider, there seems to be a lot of energy since you guys came on board over the last year and lots of new initiatives, uh, which is great for the people listening in, I guess, particularly non us users, because a lot of, lot of folks in the U S are familiar with your work. Can you tell our listeners a little bit, about running USA, the role you play in the industry, and then maybe a little bit about your role specifically as director of operations there. For sure. So Running USA has been around for over 30 years. We are a nonprofit 
B2B or trade organization. So we have about 275 member organizations that range from event operations uh, organizations to vendors that work within the running space. And as Running USA, we see ourselves as a resource and as a guide for the industry to support our members in whatever they're doing with their events or year round. So that includes putting on an annual conference that we do every February here in the U.S., but also my role as director of operations is year round to make sure that we're, we're being an industry leader. That includes putting on monthly webinars. That includes uh, a lot of research reports that we put out and just making sure that we're, we're supporting our, our industry. And part of that is um, for our international list- listeners, we work, we just created a partnership with European athletics and with running industry Alliance and also are working with mass participation world to make sure that our industry worldwide is on the same page. So we're supporting each other on an international level, but us here at running USA are very focused on growing nationally our sport and making sure that it is inclusive as inclusive and as supportive as possible. Lots of that falls on your shoulders, right? From the conference to lots of the educational stuff to to the survey we'll be discussing today. It does. We are a small team. There are four of us that are are on the Running USA staff. We're small but mighty. We do a lot. And I think we we see that a lot in the running spaces. Those other duties is assigned. The list kind of continues to grow and grow. And I've been working in the running space for the last 12 years. So it's definitely something I'm familiar with doing a lot. And it excites me to have my hand in a lot of different opportunities because along with working in the space, I'm a runner myself. I'm currently training for marathon number 21, consider running just my my favorite pastime. So I, I have a love for our sport and want to do what I can to see it grow. So whether that's planning a conference, whether that's supporting races. So part of our role as Running USA is is supporting our members. And Jay and I are fortunate enough to to be involved in operations for a lot of the races. So man, I manage the finish line of the Chicago Marathon. Jay and I will both be in New York working um, the New York City Marathon. We we get to travel a lot and support our member organization. So it's, it is a lot, but we do it because we love it. And we do it for, to see our industry grow and to see our events really thrive. You specifically, you're still in the trenches, right? I think you're heading out to Chicago soon. And uh, I think I saw on your LinkedIn that you've been involved with that event, probably others as well. Yeah. So I've been working with Chicago event management who puts on the Bank of America Chicago Marathon and Bank of America Shamrock Shuffle and thir- now the new Bank of America Chicago 13.1. I've been working with them since 2016 and their team has been great about really bringing in industry leaders to support their races. And I've worked my way up to now. This will be my third year managing the finish line of the Chicago Marathon. And it's always a great experience and I have a great team around me there, but have been fortunate enough to, to work in, in various roles with the, the Los Angeles marathon, Houston marathon, New York city marathon, um, was able to work the, the world championships when they were here in the U S for, for Oregon 22. So it, it is a small industry and we, we support each other. So it's been something I've I've really loved to do is just to be able to travel around and work other events and support other events, see how they're doing it, bring a new outside perspective to these organizations to help help move them forward. I'm feeling that the um, the conference side of things must have felt quite natural to you with your operations background. All these other things, parts of which we'll be discussing today, the educational stuff, the the data side, the surveys. How did that work out for you being involved in this in these surveys? As I said, I like to keep myself busy. I like to do a lot. And as part of that, I am in the final stages of a PhD program at the University of Louisville. So I started in 2021, um, along with doing event management work. I just have a passion for working with um, 
the the younger generation and bringing in new people into our industry. And part of that is teaching and education. So I went back to the University of Louisville to get my PhD in educational leadership focused on sport management. So along with working races, um, have had the, the opportunity to be in the classroom teaching sport marketing, sport communication, doing a lot of research on our industry. So I'm a, I'm a data guy too. And that really fits into this role at Running USA so perfectly where I get to it, I get to see the industry kind of as my students and get to support their learning and their growth through monthly webinars, through all of this data and research. And it really goes hand in hand with what I'm doing through my PhD. Hopefully I'm in the the all but dissertation process. So we'll hopefully be finished with that by the, the end of this coming school year and, and be able to contribute to a lot of the data and research of our industry so that we're not looking at trends and saying, well, it kind of seems that way, or this is the way it's always been, but let's actually put some data behind what we're doing and actually give people the data that they need to make appropriate decisions. Mm, indeed. Yeah, that's sorely lacking in the industry. Run, run, run Sign Up does uh, quite a quite a lot on that with the, the huge data troll they have. You guys do. But, you know, like, it's interesting because when I came into the industry, which is going into maybe 10 years now, getting my hands on solid data was a really big challenge. I know lots of people who in different capacities, want to go into mass participation sports, either on the race director end or the vendor end or the services end or whatever. And they're they're really after some really basic stuff, like, you know, like how many events total, you know, how many average, you know, like really, yeah. really basic stuff. And, and, and until recently, it was almost entirely absent. And even now, it's a little bit challenging putting – two and two together. So every bit of data we can get out of you guys, run sign up others is is very much appreciated. Yes, run sign up what what they do is is great, but they're they're only one organization, so it's tough because there are so many registration platforms, so many timers out there. To really be a conglomerate is something that we at Running USA want to try our best to do and to to lead for the industry. So it is How can we find all of this data and compile it so that it's usable for the industry? Because it doesn't, it's not helpful if the data, yeah, yeah, we, it's out there, but let's put it all in one place and let's show people like, what does this data actually mean and how can you make use of it? So it is a challenge. I think we've seen our industry is much more supportive than a lot where we're not necessarily holding things close to the chest where we're not going to share it with others. And I think that's a, a really big strength of our industry. And and Jay and I and our team at Running USA are big on how can we bring all that data in and then distribute it in the most user-friendly way possible. Yeah. And I think that's actually the ultimate challenge. And we'll go through some of the data and the questions being posed in the survey. It's really challenging. And it's an interesting point because I was I, I did a whole podcast on post-race surveys with Laurel Park a while back. Asking the right questions is actually more than half of the job, really, in these kinds of surveys. You know, like Because you're going to get back the, the data. The question is, what questions do you ask? So going into going into the survey, um, this is the 2024 Global Runner Survey uh, we're talking about here. Listeners may remember we did an episode uh, with Christine Bowen a couple of years back, in fact, on the 2022 Global Runner Survey. Tell us a little bit about the survey, sort of the scope of it, the aim of it, maybe any significant changes in either methodology or outcomes from previous surveys. What is it trying to do? Yeah, so the Global Runner Survey in some form has been around for a while. It, it was started by Running USA in 2007. And it's essentially trying to look at who are our runners and what do they want and what are their brand preferences, what are their racing and running preferences, and how can the industry then use that? So with uh, with new leadership at Running USA, we really looked at 
what was being asked in the survey. Like you said, it's you need to ask the right questions to make sure you're getting the right information. So we took a really deep dive back in, in April and May to see what questions are we asking in the Global Runner survey to make sure that we were getting year over year comparisons, but also asking the right questions to evolve the industry. And, and we, we've seen new areas of, of the industry. We've seen things shift and evolve. So how are we asking about those evolutions and how are we supporting those, uh, the, the races that are trying to work within those evolutions? So that was um, uh, our big challenge of us before we actually put out the Global Runner survey. And then starting in June and July, we distributed it to all of our members asking, hey, can you send this out to your member databases? Can you support us in supporting you so that we can get data from your runners to to know how they feel about it? And really wanted to make sure that we kept the survey below a 15-minute response time so that we can where we alleviate some of that survey fatigue or people answering a few questions and then leaving. And um, we're, we're fortunate enough to have over 7,000 survey responses. Our goal was around 10,000. So we were short of that goal and we've already started thinking through ways to, to bump that number up to get over that 10,000 mark in 2025 um, but we're really happy with the, the 7,400 plus responses that we received to really understand who our runners were, their demographics, their psychographics, their spending habits and all that. And so that's kind of what this global runner survey looks to do. And now that, um, that our, our questioning, we, we really were, were intentional with it to where now in 2025, we'll be able to ask a lot of these same questions to get year over year comparisons a lot better. And we have some of those for 2023, but we'll continue to see those comparisons be important as we look into 2025. Now, going into drilling a little bit into the demographics of the people who um, responded to the survey, it's fair to say, I guess, that the demographic is fairly U.S. focused in terms of the people who responded, right? It is. And that's something that we also are are looking at for the future. I think our partnerships with um, European Athletics, with Running Industry Alliance, with Mass Participation World are definitely going to help us to grow this internationally, but at some point we can't be everything to everybody. So it's, it's something we think about at running USA is first and foremost, we have to look at us runners and we're going to, to continue to grow it internationally, but always wanting to focus us first and and then continue to grow it internationally. And I think we'll see, while while cultures are different and why look while locations are different, there are a lot of similarities between runners mm-hmm. in different different cultures and different markets. So I think while the responses are heavily U.S. based, there's going to be some takeaways that are going to uh, to to be impactful for people outside of the U.S. as well. So in terms of the actual demographics, then you know, looking at gender age, income. I mean, to me, it looks like our customers are a fairly affluent bunch, just judging by the um, average incomes involved here. Do you have a sense for how the runner demographic compares to the broader US people kind of demographic? Yeah. So we, if you look at the runner de- demographic, it is h- higher female. Um, it was four survey respondents, 56% uh, identified as, as a woman, 38% as man. We had 6% of just other genders as well, which I think is important to note that we're, we're looking beyond those binaries. But when you look at the um, the average education levels, at the household income levels, they are at a higher average than the, the general U.S. population. So like you said, we do see a little more fluency with our, our running base. And that can, that, that can be viewed two ways that can be viewed. Yes, we, we can, maybe we can charge more for them, but also 
are we missing out on opportunities on these uh, of reaching people from some of these lower socioeconomic statuses? Should we be doing more to bring those people in to be more in line with the U.S. base so that that we're supporting everybody? So I think it's it shows us both those things that, yes, it's a more affluent base, which could have its benefits. But also, does that mean we're not reaching everybody and need to be doing more for uh, for more people within our cities and within our communities. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I guess, you know, running is is no golf in terms of, uh, I guess, elitism. Although golf has gone, you know, like, has, has gone everywhere these days. It's not, it's, it's no longer, uh, you know, something that only, you know, like upper middle class people do or whatever, but it is, it is indeed interesting to see if, um, if there's an opportunity for running to, to attract people, across a, a, a broader base. But as you say, higher income for the demographic we currently have, good for sponsors, good for business, all kinds of opportunities present themselves. Yes, definitely. And I think we also see when we looked at the race and ethnicity piece in this this Global Runner survey, that our respondents were a higher percentage of white respondents. So I think there's opportunity for us to to be reaching other races and ethnicities and to to support people that way as well. I think that's something we are big on at Running USA is like you said, we're not golf, but it's not the the common thing of all you need is a pair of shoes to run. While that's partly true, that also comes from a place of privilege where there are some people that don't feel safe being out there running alone or don't don't have the the health background to be able to go out there and run. So there's a lot more to it that I think we need to be addressing within our industry. Yeah, I did. That's an interesting, another interesting point because I, I did a podcast um, with Sophie Power, who is an advocate for increasing uh, women participation in ultra marathons. And one of the points she, she highlighted for me then, which I think actually it's, it's, it's an, it's an interesting one is that, I mean, you know, whether people can put on a pair of shoes and go out and run is one thing, which probably they can do. But I think getting themselves to a start line of a race, I think probably races could perhaps, I don't know the numbers, but, you know, like there could be a case there for races to try and make these people feel a little bit more welcome in racing, you know, like, which means also, you know, having people like them on the start line. It's a kind of cause and, and, you know, that kind of effect. It is. There's a, there's kind of a snowball effect there too. You get one, you start getting them in and it gets more in and it gets more in. And I think we're going to, we, we see organizations that are doing that well. And I think this global runner survey is a piece of that for us to see where our blind spots are or where, our our runners are saying this is what's getting them to the start line or this is what they want to see organizations do to support more inclusion within the running space so so this global runner survey piece is definitely part of how can we we drive that welcomeness and that welcoming within our space because inclusion i mean let's let's remind ourselves because you know it's it's a little bit of a charged word and the way uh, the the world has gone these days, you know, these things can rub people the wrong way. But inclusion, at the, the bottom line of it is, it's more people on on the start line, right? It, it it's is. basically it's growing the pie. It's getting more runners, particularly for an industry like ours, which is going in and out of plateauing, and you know, like growth is a little bit sideways. It it is important for the sport to growth, getting the people who don't run to start running. It is. It's there's there's a, a financial piece to that too. If you get more people to the start line, you get more registration dollars, you get more sponsorship money. And I think we see this in the Global Runner survey too of the the younger demographic is is smaller than it probably should be and when we look at the the running space of how can we attract younger runners into um and part of that is just the the younger generations where we see one in five identify as LGBTQ plus. So are we doing efforts for that to bring in those, those younger runners? And, and it's not a, it's not a, by bringing them in, you're going to lose other people. We're all growing from this. And and that's important to remember. Exactly. Exactly. So I watched the, um, the running USA webinar on the survey. I'm really keen on your very actionable tips on the back of the percentages, because we can quote statistics all day, but it's actually, what do you do with them? So 
let's dig into some numbers here. Running habits is a big part of the survey and a really important one. One of the numbers that struck me is that um, a quarter of people out there, they run in sort of socially. They run with other people. They do group runs. They're probably part of running clubs. I know that race directors, lots of them are in the habit of working with running clubs and, you know, like reaching out, offering discounts, that kind of thing. Does this statistic say anything more to you about what race directors can do on the back of that to encourage more people to um, to enter races? It does. I think that was something that was really striking for us too. And that was a new question to the Global Runner survey this year. We asked, in general, what are the majority of you, how do you run the majority of the runs? And the options were on my own with a friend or a group of friends and with an organized running group or club. And 51% of the people said on their own, which means half of those people said they run with other people. And I think that's huge to understand that half of these people are running with others that are they're going to running clubs they're they're doing it socially so we it's very important for race organizations to say hey are we reaching out to some of these social groups to bring them in and make them feel included in our races we have we see some really big running clubs sprouting up all over the country i mean we have Atlanta Run Club. We have Peace Runners in Chicago. We have we we run three one three in Detroit. Like St. Louis Run Crew grew, and we have we have and those are demographics of people that probably aren't at our races yet, or that we're missing out on. So it's really important for races to say like, hey, what are we doing to include these run clubs? Are we giving them St. Louis um, when in their rebrand from the Go St. Louis Marathon to Greater St. Louis Marathon? created a run club section in their post-race experience where different run clubs have their own little area after the race and, and saw a really good um, response from the community to that. So are we, are we offering those things at our races, but then are we going to meet these people where they are as, as a, a marketing arm of a race? Are you going to your weeknight run clubs and seeing just, and integrating yourself into them because I think people can see through if it's not genuine, if it's like, Hey, I'm just coming so that I can get you to my race, but no, I want to build you into this. And um, Chicago event management also does a great job with this where they took the bank of America, Chicago 13.1 and moved it to a community where they saw a thriving run club, where they saw Jackie Hoffman and peace runners doing amazing things in the West side of Chicago and said, Hey, we're going to bring a race to you and to your, and really incorporate your run club into it and have seen a lot of positive impact from that. So I think it's important for races to see in that number that half of people are running with others and figure out a way to build that into their marketing plan. Yeah. And, and I guess the flip side of races reaching out to running clubs is that many races, um, I remember vividly from my from my podcast with Brand Mister of um, Around the Crown 10K, they have, they organize group runs, which often are a fantastic opportunity also for sponsors. I mean, it's a prime asset for a sponsor to get in there for Brooks, someone like that. And say, and and as you say, if you really mean it, because yeah, people see through this thing, but if you're really, which most race directors are passionate about this, and before a race, they have a couple of nice group runs, they bring out a couple of sponsors out there, it's all organic, it's a, it's a winning combination. It really is, and I, I like that you bring up Brian, because what he's done with the Charlotte running community and around the crown has been so awesome to see that it is a year-round thing, and if you look at the deliverables for a sponsor, they're going to love that, that they're not getting exposure just one day a year, but they're getting weekly, monthly exposure to these runners. And, and you're supporting these runners along their whole journey, not just on race day or race weekend. So yeah, I, I think, I think that's a, a valuable thing of, of building that in for, for not just your runners, but for your sponsors too. So next um, interesting data point from the survey is the reasons why people run, which, I mean, to me, they seem fairly straightforward. Stay in shape, have fun, relieve stress. I guess, you know, we're all familiar with all that. 
I think those are, are very valid. And I think the have fun of it piece is something that I think we all need to remember is that we don't need to t- yes, this is a this is a very serious industry and we're putting on these these mega events that require a lot of safety, security, seriousness. But at the end of the day, it's about having fun. And like if we're if if we're having fun, they're gonna have fun. Um, but then also the stay in shape piece of it and to stay healthy. Um, it that's another big part of like we said being part of that journey with the runners where you're going to the run clubs, where you're supporting them along the training aspect is going to bring them back to your race and going to keep them invested in it. So yeah, it's not, it's not anything we didn't know, but I think it's important to keep in mind that, that fun piece of it and that, that you're, you're there training along with the runners, not just on the day of your event. And similar to the point, I guess, about um, running clubs and reaching out to running clubs, going where the runners are, is the other data point from the report about 93% of runners, not really particularly surprising, also doing other activities besides running, going to the gym, going to fitness classes, doing swimming, cycling, all of that kind of stuff. And that actually... I know lots of race directors, you know, they they would be quite familiar with the reaching out to running clubs piece and maybe, I guess, you know, putting a couple of posters up in the local gym. But I don't think I see much cross-sport type of promotions, right? So, you know, maybe you go to your local cycling event or the local swimming event or or a yoga class or something like that. Particularly locally, I guess it's it's a quite powerful thing to do. I think the running space can learn a lot from other fitness spaces too. If you look at like high rocks, which is very, it's growing in popularity here in the U S or, or CrossFit on that thing where it's, it is, they're going to their local gyms, they're going to their local fitness studios. And there is, it's, we're seeing that our runners are there. So why aren't we as well? Why aren't we doing more than just putting up a poster in a gym? But hey, let's lead group runs from our gym. Let's, let's provide training programs or make sure that the personal trainers have, are aware of what's going on and have access to, to training documents or to support the people that are going there for weight training. So yeah, it's, it's, it is, it, it's valuable to know, like our runners aren't just running. They're doing a lot more than that. And let's meet them in those places. And I guess the thing we've got going for us, particularly in running is that running has a fairly low barrier to entry Lots of people run, which I guess is the flip point of runners do 93% of other stuff. The the flip side of that is that lots of people who do other stuff also run. So, you know, you go out to any other sport, you know, you're not pitching fencing here or triathlon even. You know, running means that, you know, people will likely run when you reach out to another sports activity. And if I'm not talking a marathon, but if you're doing a local 5K, 10K, supporting a good cause, there's lots of people who would turn out for a 5k, you know, without even much training. Right. And I think a lot of people are growing up. If you, if you play another sport or doing it, sometimes running seen as punishment. So I think it's important for, for race organizations to make sure that they're adding those fun elements into it. I mean, people say they wanted to, to, to run for fun. Let's make it not a punishing thing. Let's add in entertainment along the way. Let's make it an experience for people so that they're, they're more likely to leave the gym and actually participate in a 5k, not because it's uh, a punishment or something that they have to do, but something they really want to do because it's fun. So you've got a great thing going, you've built a great event that people love from the ground up, and you're ready to take it to the next level. But is your technology up to it? If you've been hacking your way so far using different tools for different jobs, having a so-so website and spending hours moving data back and forth from your registration platform to your email marketing provider and so on, it's time you upgraded your tech before you look into upgrading your race. With Run Signups All-in-One Technology Solution, you'll get all the tools you need and more all in one place to help you build a solid foundation that will help support your race's growth for years to come. Free email marketing, an awesome free custom website, a fully customizable registration experience, and awesome fundraising and participant-to-participant referral tools are just some of the things you'll be getting when you join Run Signups' industry-leading platform. 
With that, you'll get the resources and support you need to get you through the next stages of your growth journey and an amazing suite of race day tools to help you deliver a world-class race day experience to your participants and fans. So, to learn more about Run Signups market leading technology used by over 28,000 in-person, virtual and hybrid events and to book a free demo tailored to your needs, make sure to visit runsignup.com today. That's runsignup.com and see what Run Signups awesome race technology can do to take your event to the next level. Okay. Now, let's get back to the episode. You've been in the industry a long time. You're a competitive runner. You know, you you run marathons quite quite regularly. You mentioned the race experience. Yes. Um and there was also a data point on the report uh, that I didn't touch on uh, earlier on on the demographics between sort of how many people self-identify as recreational runners versus competitive runners. And maybe you also have the privilege of of some some insights into the trends of those numbers over over time. Is it fair to say that As the sport has opened up, we're moving a little bit away from the competitive element and more towards the race experience element as time goes by. Exactly. So we saw in 2023, that was a, a question that was asked last year. We saw that more people actually are identifying as serious or competitive runners, but also more people are jogger and recreational. So we're seeing more people moving from walker to runner, but we're seeing also like both ends of it are growing both the competitive end and the recreational end. And so I think it is important for races to, to realize like, yes, the front of your pack is important, but just, or just as, or more important, maybe the, the back of the pack runners or the people that are, that it's a lot more challenging for them. So, so I, I think we need a few more years of that to see what that is. And, and that's something in an upcoming running USA survey or research that we're going to put out is looking at finishing times and how they've changed over the, the last 10 years. Have people gotten faster? Have people gotten slower in each of these distances so that we really can see what is happening? Are, are, are more people identifying as runners or more people getting more competitive? How is that changing? Yeah, I think historically the trend has been on average finish times. Average finish times have been creeping up, which basically means that the sport has been going more and more mainstream because, you know, like, yeah. you know, back in, in, in Fred's time in the New York Marathon, you know, you had like 10 crazy folks who were running around the year, you know, like yeah. doing crazy times. Now that the New York Marathon has 50,000 runners, obviously times are going to be a little bit, you know, like uh, broader than that. Totally. And we're seeing races add in longer cutoff times. I mean, Hawaii has done a great job with it, with their marathon. New York, I encourage if anybody, I know this is coming out before the New York marathon. If you're going to be there, go out to that finish line at eight or nine o'clock at night and you won't find a better atmosphere than those. Like they build in that experience for those last runners. So it's, it is making more people feel welcome at the races so that if they're finishing in three hours or if they're finishing in eight hours, it's just as good of an experience for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, I totally agree with you. That's what it's all about. Those kinds of folks. It's, it's really inspiring. Let's move on to event participation. Another large piece of the uh, survey with lots of great information in it. Just a couple of highlights for people they may not be familiar with. So on average, people in the survey responded that they run uh, around 11 events per year, which sounds quite a lot to me, actually. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, though, that's one event a month. That's not not terrible. So if you're training for a half marathon or a marathon, that means you're doing a 5K and a 10K leading up to it. You're doing doing one event a month and it's actually down. We saw that number was 12 per, was 12 in 2023. So not, not down much, but 11 events a year means if you're only putting on one event a year, maybe you're missing out on opportunities to catch those runners at other times of the year. Absolutely. And of course, the all time favorite distance, the half marathon still raining over other distances. No surprise. I think it's a, it's a great distance to run, right? It's just about challenging enough for most people. And there's some fantastic half marathons out there in terms of event experience. So not really a surprise there. 
No, we saw 35% said it was their favorite distance. So it was by far and away the next highest. So 35 for half marathon, the next highest was 17% for 5k. So it was almost 20 percentage points higher than any other of people saying, you know what? I like the half marathon the most. One part of the uh, survey that I found uh, really interesting and of course, very helpful to um, to our audience is the reasons why people would choose to do an event. I think this is probably one of the most important data points in the survey. So top three reasons, location, distance, course, entry fee comes close at uh, number four, least popular reasons in reverse order. So going from the back, from the least popular reason to join a race, at least from the ones that you presented in the survey, sustainability, inclusivity, chip timing. And then again, on fourth least popular benefit uh, that the race would benefit a cause or a charity. That was surprising to us kind of too. We added, we actually added in some of those elements to see Are people looking at the sustainability efforts of an organization and saying, okay, I want to align myself with these or align myself with the values of the organization? And people said that that wasn't important to them necessarily. And I think it's, it's as an industry, we shouldn't look at that and say, well, people don't care about sustainability. We don't need to care about sustainability. I think that's, that's important to, to note is that we need to be showing our participants maybe why they should be caring about that. I mean, if you're in the U S right now, so many areas of the U S are seeing effects of climate change and global warming that races are having to, to change their dates, to cancel, um, to, to move locations. So they may not say that that's important to them, but maybe it should be more important to them. But also when you look at those top things of event location, desirable course, distance, the uh, preferable distance, those are really opportunities for races to highlight those. Is your, uh, is your website homepage showing the beautiful aspects of your course? Does it have photos of the landscape that, that your course is running through? Does it highlight the distances, the, if it's flat or fast, or if it's scenic, the, those valuable pieces of what, what makes your course stand out is going to be really important. And then I think that event location being number one also is something to really drive home of, of what are you showing about your community, about your city that is unique and that should bring people in to that community. If we look at some of the the races that have grown the most, it's not that they're in the biggest cities, but they're incorporating in elements of their city. Like the Eugene marathon is finishing on historic Hayward, Hayward fields track. Like that's really cool. And something that's, that only can be done in Eugene is to finish on Hayward fields track. So, so bringing in some of those elements of your location to really feature those in your marketing and in your, your race plans. Yeah, I think the uh, your point on sustainability is an important one that, you know, whether people care or not about sustainability, I mean, there's two separate things here, right? Is would someone enter an event because they believe it to be more sustainable? The survey seems to suggest that, you know, that's not very high on people's agendas. That's a completely separate point from whether events need to be sustainable. Events need to be sustainable because it's the right thing to do for everyone involved, for local communities, for the planet, for everyone, okay? To the extent that it doesn't hurt the bottom line too much, which I think nowadays is possible. I think one of the things, because we've done a few podcasts on sustainability, you know, with different products coming onto the market, different experts. I think one of the things that race directors struggle to do is um, tell the story of sustainability in an engaging way. I think we need to be a little bit more imaginative in, in in the way that sustainability is highlighted through events and the kinds of initiatives we take. To be fair, the low-hanging fruit, which is offering a wood metal, uh, which can be pretty awesome, but they leave them feeling a little bit short-changed. And that's actually, you know, this this is coming from the people who work in these kinds of fields, right? We need to be a little bit a little bit smarter. You know, the partnerships that we do with the industry, bringing in sustainability sponsors who may sponsor your your water station, that kind of thing, help you 
go cupless, you know, which is a big thing now in the industry, even in road racing. We just need to do better and be smarter about this kind of thing. And I think you you made a good point of, of there is low hanging fruit there and there are easy things that races can do. And um, running USA, that's something we want to really support. Um, Tina Muir is one of our, our board members and I love the work she does because she just makes it seem she breaks it down to a level where runners can understand, where organizers can understand that you're not having to make these massive changes. But does your website, when your registration process, offer people no shirt option? Some people don't need a shirt or don't want a shirt, but are you making them choose a shirt that they're then just going to not use? Are you offering cupless races? Do you have refill stations along the way where somebody doesn't want to grab a cup at a water stop that they can just go fill up through a, a pitcher or a mug? So working with organizations like Hydropack that, that have these options for cupless races, there are things that are easy for race organizations, for runners to do that I think highlighting those may not bring new runners in, but it's going to keep runners around and going to going to be the right thing to do to keep your organization afloat and to keep your community at a better place, to leave it a better place than you found it, which I think any organization should want to do. And the other thing I'm getting from this list, again, a, a focus on race experience type items. So you have course on number three, you have swag, um, I think it was around number five or something. You have sort of middle of the pack people choosing races because of the venue being a vacation destination, which I often do with racing. You know, like I I, I want to go to an interesting place, maybe particularly if it's a marathon or a, a race you'll be training for for a while. You want to go to an interesting place. So sort of looking at the at the hierarchy of these things, to me, it, it, it looks like the decision making of a runner is one and two, location, distance. Is it the race I'm looking for to begin with, right? So just ticking the boxes of, you know, is this the thing I'm looking for? Number four, can I afford it? Entry fee. And then is it going to be a nice race? Course, swag, vacation, where it's held. And then sort of everything else. Even chip timing seems to be fairly uh, down the list. Yeah, and I, and I think that may be because nowadays, like it's kind of assumed that all races are going to be chip time and that, it's just part of the experience now. So maybe people think, and maybe that's the same thing with just inclusivity of values is we think like, Hey, organizations are going to be that way no matter what. So, so let's focus on the things that are different among the races, like their, their vacation and their, their cost or their entry fee and their course and, and what swag they're providing. And indeed swag is at the top of the list when it comes to what people actually value when they are at the event. People love a good swag item. They love a good medal. I actually have right behind me medals from different races I've done. So I'm right there with it. Like you like the swag that you get. So I think it's important to note that and to be unique in that where the swag doesn't have to be a t-shirt. Cause that's another thing we asked in the global runner survey is like, what other items would you prefer other than a t-shirt? People said top three were hat socks in a glass or mug. So there are other options where you can be a little bit more unique with what you're giving, but people do love that swag. Mm, absolutely. I, I personally would love a mug because as you say, the shirt, people who run lots of races, particularly, I mean, your average runner runs 11 races a year, right? You, you can't, you can't wear all those t-shirts. Lots of those t-shirts, let's face it, they're not the kind of shirt you'd enjoy running in anyway because you know they're not top end kind of uh, you know fabrics and and designs so socks absolutely hats great very versatile mugs of course i mean you can't have enough mugs can you totally it's it's one of those i i love getting different new stuff and i think a lot of our our vendors are really good at supporting some of those new things and if we're looking at like a younger generation I feel like I went to a music festival last weekend and everybody was wearing a fanny pack or a crossbody bag. So maybe giving something like that out that people are going to use 
outside of when they're running, because we're seeing that runner, like you said, runners are going to the gym, runners are going and hiking. What, what items are we giving them that they can use in these other places? Yeah. And speaking of shirts, actually give them a shirt. That's not technical. Give them a play, like either a tri blend or a nice cotton shirt, right? That doesn't have the sponsor. That's just a nice, a nice shirt you can wear around the year. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely one of those while I've, I understand the importance of sponsors on the back and giving them visibility. Is someone going to then wear around your shirt that I I like to call it kind of logo soup where it's just a lot of logos on there and, and what is the true value of that in the future? So I, I love being in the industry for as long as I am. I love when I go out on a run in my city and see people actually wearing the shirts that from races that I've put on over the years and be like, okay, somebody actually finds value in wearing that again and, and making that. And also I think it's important, like I noted, giving people the option to opt out if they don't want it. And, and that's just a a good way to save your budget, but also to, to be more sustainable in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So number three in the kinds, in the things that people value, of course, another great favorite, uh, restroom facilities. Yes. <laughs> you can't have enough porta potties, I guess. Uh, you know, ca- can't go wrong with, with, with having more porta potties in a race, right? No one ever complained for too many porta potties. No, never. I, I think that's definitely an, an easy thing to, if you're thinking about, do we need to add more? Where can we, add more budget porta potties is a good line item because there are going to be people that want it and, and making sure that you're offering those facilities because that's something people are going to remember is if they didn't make it to the start line in time because they were in line for the porta potty. And is that going to keep them from coming back in the future? Mm -hmm. Another one of the, of the um, favorites up there is um, course distance accuracy. I actually wouldn't have put it myself that high. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have expected the average runner to care that much about course distance accuracy, but there it is. We did a whole uh, podcast, actually three, four episodes back on uh, course measurement and certification. It is an important piece to all this. Like people actually value that. It is. I think it's important to note that, that like, it's not, people aren't training for a half marathon ish. They're training for a half marathon and they want that accurate distance because and I think it's the little things like you, you hear the, the stories of um, bands and concert or bands when on their rider will put like all green M&Ms and it's because they're wanting you to see the details. That's a de- If a race is missing those little details of like they're not even making their course the accurate measurement, what else are they missing and what else are they not? So let's let's actually those details of getting a course accurate. It doesn't, yes, I think there's a lot of value in, in getting a course certified and, and, um, measured properly. But if it's a a community 5k, you may not need to pay to bring in a, a USATF measurer for it, but are you running that? Like me as a race director, I love to run the course over and over and over again, just to make sure that my GPS one time through or two times through isn't getting off somewhere that I'm providing an accurate course, even if I'm not going through the the Jones counter certification measuring process. Have you thought in this section asking people about race announcers? I think it would be really interesting to know whether the race announcer is something that runners uh, value. That's a good no. That is that is something we've we've looked at. We do have some really good race announcers who are members of Running USA, and something we're looking at adding into either conference or a webinar, like what makes a good race announcer and how important is a good race announcer. So we haven't necessarily asked that to runners, but we've thought about how to build that into our our running USA initiatives in the future. And I think that's a good point of potentially adding that in because we saw race communications are really important to runners. And part of that could be the race announcer who's making those on-site communications. I think they add a lot to the race experience personally. I think it's, it's one of those, that, and I'm only saying this because it might convince more people or persuade more people to consider having a race announcer in their race. Because I think, I mean, it, it is a cost, it, you know, and it, and it is an optional cost, you know, like just 
factually speaking, you don't, you don't, you know, you can put on a race without a race announcer. But I think they add so much to even a, even a five k that um, it would be nice to perhaps see some of that reflected in the data, so we can also say that you know actually runners also value that quite highly. Yeah, that's a good point. We added in a whole section on race communication this year, and, and as part of that in the future, maybe we add in there about how much do you think about the race announcer or value that in your experience. We're getting into the race communication in a second. One very important data point before that, you asked people, are race fees too expensive? I guess no one ever said yes, uh, right? No, they're not. Exactly. Right? I mean, whatever whatever race fees might be, I, I mean, I don't even know what to make of the data for this question. It's, it's something I've been tracking uh, through the Global Running Survey for a while. It never changes, does it? I mean, can, can we expect any surprise here? So just for, just for the numbers, 63% of people either strongly or somehow agree. So basically 63% of people think that race fees are too expensive. 26% are sort of neutral on that. Um, only 11% disagree. I mean, I guess we we'll, would like to have those uh, running our races, but does that is there is there anything in this kind of data point? I mean, people are always going to think races are expensive. I don't think there necessarily is. I think there's more in looking at we asked along with our race fees too expensive. We asked if participants would pay more for a VIP race experience. So I think that's there's more value in that. I think it is in it. It, it does stay around the same number of people who say it is too expensive, and there's. We, we asked further in the survey, like, what are you looking, what are you willing to spend on a race? So I think there's value more in that. Um, we did include this in just because it, it is like, it would be interesting to see if that changes, but you're right. I don't think it's going to change much, but instead let's look at like, what are people willing to spend money on? And then how much are they willing to spend per event distance? Yeah, I saw those numbers actually in the survey. Uh, as you say, you ask people, what do you think is a fair price to pay for different types of distances? Um, and I compared them actually to the latest um, run sign-up numbers from, for averages for those distances. And the two seem to line up quite well. I mean, obviously for the marathon, you have, because you have those high profile marathons, you have some races pricing above that. But now we're talking, you know, like the really top one, two percent of races. But it seems that, you know, like runners expectations are very, very close, actually correlated with the reality of where race fees actually are. Yeah. So so while they may say it's too expensive, they're still willing to pay those average prices and, and believe those to be fair. So so runners aren't different than other people that we we like to complain about something. So we're going to find those those things to say it's too expensive. You know how everyone these days talks about the race experience? Well, there's big truth to that. Now, someone once said, as a race director, you're not really in the racing business. You're really in the experience design business. And one of the most important aspects of creating a great race experience for your participants is getting them to share their experience with their loved ones on race day. Well, that's traditionally been an expensive business reserved for only the largest of races, but not anymore. With Brooks's Laurel Timing Technology, you can bring affordable participant tracking to your race and the joy of engaging AI-driven commentary for your spectators following their loved ones around the course. Not to mention, peace of mind for you and your crew with pinpoint accurate participant positioning for everyone around the course. It is that simple to make your next race an experience none of your participants will ever forget. So, to learn more and to book in your next race for an amazing, exclusive Head Start 50% off, head over to brooksy.com forward slash Head Start. That's brooksy, B-R-O-O-K-S-E-E dot com forward slash Head Start and see what Brooks's patented Laurel Timing Technology can bring to your next race. Okay, back to the podcast. Another data point, very important, I think, in terms of advertising and managing marketing spend, is um, the data on the distance that people are willing to travel 
four different types of events and actually quite well presented in the survey as well with like a nice little graph for it. Um, two points there that I think are important on the two extremes of it is that 37%, would say roughly half of the people who participate in 5Ks are only willing to travel up to 30 miles. I think yes. this is important for the 5K, 10K crowd who want to keep it local. And I think this is important where, you know, you go on Facebook, you want to run some ads, or you're thinking of doing some marketing or your local radio, whatever. Think about this number that a good chunk of people, 40%, are not willing to travel any longer than 30 miles. And then yes. on the other side of things, on the halves and marathons, more than half of the people asked, 54%, are willing to travel 300 miles or more, which, you know, makes, which makes, I guess, you know, like it's a complete, it's one of those few data points where the 5K, 10Ks and the halves and marathons show a completely different picture in terms of dynamics and, and um, sort of runner behavior and attitudes. They do. And I think you, you nailed it when you said like, where are you spending your marketing dollars on Facebook or on, um, on if you're being hyper, hyper local or looking at other markets. I, I know a lot of half marathons that have looked at where are direct flights from my city. And then can I go to those cities and promote it expos or promote, to those markets because people are willing to travel for a half marathon from another city, but let's make it not too tough. Let's make it a direct flights from there, but let's stay hyper local with our five K's and 10 K's. I also think it's important if you have a half marathon, do you have a five K or 10 K option to maybe capture some of the local crowd that, uh, that you're missing out on because they're traveling other places for half marathons or marathons, but we see people are running 11 events a year. So maybe that's an opportunity for you to add in a shorter distance while you have the roads closed down to do a 5k for that local audience that may not be ready to do a half marathon or may not want to do a local half marathon. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Great points. Um, if you can, as you say, the roads are closed, put on a 5, 10, uh, 5K, 10K. I think uh, margins are pretty good on those um, as well. So it, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not as easy as, oh, we have roads closed, let's put on a 5K, but it's something to consider when you're, I, we see a lot of late races adding in those other distances. Now, you mentioned the communications bit here where um, Meg had her finger, I guess. Yes, Treat PR reached out to us and said, hey, we want to see like, we know commute. Obviously, they know communications are important, but like we said, let's have some numbers to back it up, and let's build that into the Global Runner Survey. And that's really kind of what we did: is look to like how important are communications to participants? Absolutely. And Meg, what what a what a what a force in the industry, isn't she? I mean, she's uh... great. I mean, it, it's 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 again an, an example of people that care about the industry, that have passion for it, that are hustling and really working hard to see the industry improve. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and she's great at it. Okay, so one, I guess there's a few there's a few elements to the marketing and communications bit here. The one that highlights and captures the whole thing quite well is the response to the statement, the quality, frequency, and timing of pre- and post-race communications is important. So basically, how important really is that email, that pre-race email or, the, or that post-race email um, to people? And it, it, the, the numbers are quite compelling. 75% of people agree with that statement. And thinking about it, it makes total sense, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. I mean, people want to know what they're getting into, what they're spending their money on, what they should expect out of the experience. So are we providing all that information on our website? Uh, it, surprisingly to me, it was a, a smaller number of people that said a social media presence was important. Only 24% of respondents said that it was important that the race, the event had a prominent social media presence. So they want communications, but it doesn't necessarily have to be social media. And I think uh, an element we can really take from that is what, how much are we sharing with our participants and how often beforehand we see people registering almost a year in advance. And then are we just forgetting about them until 
two days before the race when they sent, we send them the info on packet pickup or we, or are we communicating updates about the race, about the, what their experience. And then another important piece of that is we see a lot of races have weather issues, have um, changes that are going on at the last minute. So are we really being proactive with communicating any updates about what may be happening with race start times, with locations, with any of that, and, and participants are finding that valuable. And then are we not just leaving them as soon as the race is op- over? Um, I, I ran a half marathon this weekend and I loved that I went to their website right after the race and right at the top of it, they had a results link. They had already made it. They built the website to where right after the race, it had exactly what I wanted at the top of the website, that it was very easy to find. Am I, am I making those kind of decisions to where somebody's not having to go search through everything to find their photos or to find their results, but I'm making it really easy for them to find it after the race as well. I think you're, uh, you're quite generous in uh, choosing, you know, weather updates as an example for this, because I think lots of lots of races, from my experience as a participant in races, fail at a very much lower bar than that. I think the, the gripe people have that is reflected in the seventy five percent urgency to ask race directors to communicate more is not about not communicating. You know, when a hurricane comes to town, I think it's it's mar- much more pedestrian stuff like. The number of times where I need to chase races for simple stuff, it's like radio silence until day before and you don't know where you need to show up, what you're doing, you know, like where do where you're parking? Like I think I think we we need to do much better in this in the simple stuff, right? I mean, it's interesting because right, as a race director, because you have all that information in your head, sometimes it, it creates a little bit of a, of a blindness and you're thinking, you know, obviously people would, you know, oh, that's obvious or that's obvious or people would know about this. And often even in our group, people complain, lots of participants ask questions that can be found on the website or can be found on FAQs or that they've been communicated before. But I think when that happens quite a lot, you need to flip that and ask yourself like, okay, I feel I've told people 10 times over, but, you know, people are not dumb. I mean, you know, like most people are, if I get 10 people asking the same thing, maybe I need to communicate more or better in a different way. It can't be that all these people are complaining. They, they just go online and write emails for no reason. Exactly. And I think it's important to know, like, am I placing in more spots than just the FAQs? I think uh, a big piece of pre and post race communication is the, the, the methods with which we're doing it. Are we going to our local news stations? Are we reaching out? Are we, are we using multiple mediums to reach people so that they're finding it on social media, on our website, through emails? Like let's reiterate a lot of these points. And, and like you said, it's, it can be some of the basic stuff of where to park, where to show up. I'm always amazed at how I go to some race websites and it's tough for me to find the start time of the race. Do you have your start time listed right there next to your date is super important. So I think just really thinking through the mediums with which we're communicating and making sure that it's not just, oh, we put it in one place. So they're, they're going to find it there. It can be tough. So let's put it in multiple places and make it as easy as possible for them. So one of the perhaps apparently contradictory aspects of this report, although I think I know how to reconcile it, is that although people in the communications bit said that a race's presence on social media isn't all that important, when it comes to the discovery side of things, meaning how did I find a race, social media is at 48%. And my guess is, which is actually as high as the top the top ways that people discover events, which is Google and then word of mouth and friends and family. So Google is at 52%, friend and family 52%, word of mouth 52%. And then right after that, just before running website listings, which is also important at 47%, social media at 48%. And my guess there is that People discover lots of races on social media through paid ads, but a race having an organic presence on social media is no longer, sadly, 
very important for people because of how low organic reach uh, is on social media. Yeah, that was surprising to us as well to see that people are finding out about races there, but they don't necessarily care about a social media presence. And I think that's important to remember that like social media is just one piece of the arsenal for communications and that people are finding it through your website, through your emails, through your press releases. So um, it is important to draw them in, but maybe once they're in, it's not the only place that they're looking for information about your race once you have them. And like you said, the organic reach of it may not be as high as it could be to to help them find the race through some kind of paid reach. But I think in general, when you look at how people find out about the races, a lot of it is grassroots. It's a lot of, are, are we showing up on Google searches? Are we showing up in our community so that word of mouth is picking up? And and it is really important to to have that word of mouth and to have friends and family members having good experiences so that they're going back and telling other people about the race or telling people to join them at the race. At 27%, promoting your event at another event or expo, although not one of the top factors, not surprisingly, it's still a good way to promote your event, right? Going out there, similar events, expos, and just being part of that community and promoting that event right there and then where runners are. It is. I think I think that's something to remember too, is it may not be where you want to spend the most of your money, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be going to expos. And and I think it's important too to note that you can't just be at the expo. You have to do you have to have a presence at the expo. You have to draw people in at the expo. So I know I go to just being a runner, I go to plenty of expos and there's so many booths that I just pass up because there's nothing that's kind of enticing me or drawing me in. So you can't just have a a social media site. You can't just have the expo, like be at an expo. You have to actually have a presence there and make sure that you're, you're making the most of it and not just being present. Influencers, fairly new trend, they scored... 9% 9% as a means of uh, runners discovering races. I don't know what to make of this number. Is I don't know whether it was there last year, uh, whether it's growing or not. That was a new ad for this year. So I'm curious to see if that grows in the future. And I think that's maybe undervalued and something that if we, we see a lot of places, I think it's in, it, influencer is a very broad word, but a lot of places, a lot of races have ambassador programs. Those are influencers. They may be more of a micro influencer, but how are we utilizing them? So I think it will be, as we continue the global runner survey, interesting to see if that number grows and and how to use those. And we're actually planning a session at Running USA on how to utilize influencers because it, I think they are growing within our industry and just in general in the marketing plans of organizations. Yeah, because you see this 9% number compared to the other ones, you know, like Google, word of mouth at 52. Uh, and you're thinking, oh, like this is this is a really small number. Of course it would be because influencers is is by, by design a very micro type marketing um, thing, but actually looking at it, I would, I would say it's pretty impressive that it's even at 9%. I mean, you know, it's considering the number of people who do races. And I think that's probably actually, it's explained by what you said about race ambassadors. Yes. If you extend influencers to include race ambassadors, then yeah, race ambassadors, actually they play a very important role in terms of marketing events and they have great results. They do. And I think, I think influencers too, we see a lot of races that are using influencers outside of the running space. I think mascot sports here in the U S is doing a great job of this with like the Diplo run club or Travis Barker running events that they're bringing new people into our sport by utilizing influencers who may not be just runners, but may just be lifestyle influencers that were bringing people in. Um, Boulder Thon also did a really good job of this recently of utilizing influencers in different spaces to to draw in new people that may not be your everyday runner, but are going to participate because they saw somebody just in the lifestyle space who's participating. So last section in the survey is the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Uh, section. 
looking at the numbers here, and I think we, we saw that actually earlier, a hint of that in the why do people choose events part of the survey. It seems that most runners don't seem to be actively selecting events that rank highly in this uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging category. But I wonder whether that's a little bit misleading, right? Because I guess the people for whom this kind of thing would be important are the minorities and the underrepresented groups that care more about this kind of thing, right? So if, if you ask the broad population of runners, you know, is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging important to you? I guess you'd get lukewarm responses because lots of people, you know, they're not touched by this kind of thing. I mean, personally. Yeah. The ones that we're trying to bring into the industry are the ones that aren't taking this survey. So I think it's not in the same way we talked about the sustainability piece, not drawing people in. That doesn't mean that it's not valuable and it's not important. I think hopefully we'll see this number grow of people seeing that our industry needs to be more inclusive and belonging because we're bringing in new people to the industry that have that feeling, that have that mentality, that we're really mirroring society because there are people that we're not reaching that aren't taking this survey that, that, that do find this valuable. And I think a big part of inclusivity, as, I, as we discussed earlier in the podcast, is including people from lower incomes. I, mean, I think for me, this is really important. These days when we speak of inclusivity and diversity, sort of different types of stuff is the first stuff that comes to mind. But we shouldn't forget that that's a big, big part of inclusivity, getting people from all kinds of incomes into racing. And one of the, um, one of the questions you asked there, which I found quite interesting, is what kind of initiatives would improve that? And 41% of people said having income-based entry fees. Now, I don't know whether that's something that uh, is a thing in the US or or right, even practically how you would implement something like that. Is it? I know that we mentioned Brian Mister and Around the Crown 10K earlier. They do a pay what you can, which is sort of along those lines. But ha- have you seen uh, or, or do you know of any races that do income-based entry fees or do any kind of adjustments for disadvantaged people? I don't. And I think there is an opportunity within our industry to do that, to to provide opportunities like that. And I think our registration platforms are so innovative. And I think it could be a challenge that they could help us solve of how can we build in some kind of and I, I think it's tough. It would it would be tough to do it like income based, but along the lines of pay what you can, or I I always have this idea of like, can I donate a little extra money to support somebody else coming to the, can I pay somebody else's race entry and be able to do that? Giving that option to participants when they register, because I think there are people out there that would say like, yes, I'm willing to pay $35 to this race, but I also I I'm I know know that I have a little more money, so maybe I can pay sixty dollars and cover somebody else's part of somebody else's registration. So I think there is an opportunity there for our registration companies for Running USA to maybe help support races as they they create new pricing models and get creative there that we can operate on some kind of pay as you can or or supporting people that. Um, are from lower income levels. Yeah, I don't remember the details of this in our uh, podcast on Around the Crown 10K. Brian went through the uh, details of pay what you can and how it actually worked. Because, you know, obviously one of the first questions is, you know, are people going to try and arb that and everyone, you know, show up for free? And, you know, like what? how does it impact the economics? And actually they've come to a very practical implementation of it, which as far as I remember goes a little bit like a checkout you can provide some extra money to pay for someone who can't. And also the number of scholarships, I guess, that you give out to people that allows them to participate for free is capped at 200 people or, you know, like some percentage of the event. So there are practical ways to do it. And I think one of the things that Brian was telling me there um, is that people don't game the system. People are being honest. When they can afford to pay, they pay. And when they can't afford to pay, they are sincere about not not affording to pay. Like you, you'd think that you know people would try to game it and everyone rush in and, and sign up for free, but people don't do that actually. 
I think that just speaks to the the human the human piece of this is we are inherently like it it's tough to do, but we should inherently see the good in people and that people, especially in the running space, runners are a for the most part are good people and are gonna be honest about that and gonna gonna really support each other and not necessarily game the system. Now I want to end up on what was probably the most surprising thing for me in the survey in a pleasant way, which is the runner profiles. I actually found them extremely interesting. So the runner profiles, and I was suspecting um, Meg's fingerprint on this as well, but apparently I saw on the webinar that it's something that you guys have done before. So the runner profiles are a a kind of marketing persona, right? That's, That's how I saw it. Basically you say, okay, like, let me put tags on people and let me create groups around different subgroups of people who run. So you have, let's say, you know, your, your, uh, you know, black runners, or you have your female runners, or you have runners who have been running only since 2020 or so, so your new runners. And then you take out the data, the survey data of those subgroups and you compare how they're doing compared to the averages. So, for instance, you know, you're finding that, not surprisingly, people who only recently started running, uh, they're more likely to be recreational runners rather than competitive runners um, and all these kinds of things, which when you read the runner profile, uh, and it's quite extensive, actually, it paints a very vivid picture for you, which is an obvious one. I mean, you know, there's no surprises. You know that the marathon runner is more likely, you know, to be doing, to be spending more on shoes or to be doing more races or something. But I find with these marketing personas, it's so valuable when you're going out marketing or advertising your event to have that vivid profile of all those different people in mind and how you can reach them differently and speak to them differently and have a different message for them. So very well done for that. I thought it was a a really great aspect of the report. Yeah. So we, we did 10 runner profiles this year and, um, and I was pretty strategic with what I pulled, just looking at what are some larger groups that we can pull out of there um, that, that may have some differences. Like one that I wanted to pull out was how are international runners different than, the, how were international respondents different than U.S.? And there weren't differences, really. So that was in, – in our international number, we only had 6% of survey respondents who are international. So maybe as we grow that number, it'll it'll change. But um, I, I do think it is important to not look at runners as a monolith and not think that all runners are the same and that we can look at all of this survey data and say – every runner is going to be reached by word of mouth because they said this on there, but like, let's, let's actually divide up these runners based off of some of their profile characteristics to see how we can reach them separately. And, and I think that's something I want to continue to grow of like, how can we pull even more profiles out of that information? Because the more we're able to do that, the, the help more helpful it'll be to races to really target specific groups and to, to hone their marketing efforts to those individual groups. No, I think it's super important for marketing, particularly now that targeting those subgroups of people is made possible through the targeting engines of, you know, Facebook and other platforms. You know, I think it makes a lot of sense to say, okay, newer runners are more likely, for instance, as you highlight in the report, to be single rather than married. So maybe I highlight an aspect of my event that is, you know, geared more towards these guys. So I don't put all my advertising spend on just runners. And then on a subgroup who might be more likely to be married, maybe I highlight, you know, what I, what the family can do in the during the race. Those kinds of things. So it's I think it's super super important information if you decide to make good use of it. Yeah, I definitely encourage people just to check out the global runner survey for all of it. But yeah, for those profiles specifically are very valuable. Speaking of which, how can people uh, get hold of the, uh, of the global runner survey? So the global runner survey in the past was a paid report that people would have to pay to download and to view. Um, Thanks to a spark, a partnership this year with active network, um, we decided that all Running USA members get free access to 
the global runner survey. Um, part of that is just to bring more, more people into running USA to bring more value to our members. So for non-members, it is available for, you can purchase it. Um, I want to say it's like $299, which is just a little bit less than a membership to running USA. And we kind of were strategic with that because we want to bring people in as members, get them involved. Um, but it is available on our website, uh, runningusa.org. We have all of our reports available. We have a, a new partnership with Athlinks, the finished results organization to where we have reports that we're putting out year round based on a lot of that finisher data. So along with the runner survey, you can find information about um, race, a lot of different race reports on our report section of runningusa.org. Absolutely. How can people reach you if they want to maybe send a message of support or have a question about something relating to Running USA, the conference or something else? Yeah, I, you reach out to me by email, michael at runningusa.org. Also, um, I will be in a lot of different cities coming up soon. So I'll be in New York for the New York Marathon, Chicago, if this comes out before then. Um uh, New York, we will, Running USA will be doing an industry reception as well. Um, New York Roadrunners is offering up their run center on Saturday, late afternoon for a industry, free industry reception. So reach out to me at michael at runningusa.org if you're going to be in New York, but I'll also be in Athens for European Running Business Conference and in, um, in England for run, the running conference. So trying to get some of our international friends um, get, get networked and get up with them. Um, but also just via email and social media, Jay and I are, are really big on doing what we can to support the industry. So if you have any questions, if you have any, uh, recommendations for us, we are all ears on, on what we can do to move our industry forward. Awesome. You should send me your, uh, your bib number. Uh, if I don't run the Athens marathon, I'm always out there supporting and clapping for people. So you should, Yeah, it'll be marathon number 21. I've heard it's hilly and can be hot. So it's both of those things. Not ideal, but Hey, it's it, when else will I be able to run from marathon and finish on the original Olympic stadium? It'll be cool. Indeed, indeed. I mean, the, the feeling going into that stadium is uh, surreal. So you're, you're up for a treat there. You're really excited about the experience. I hope you have a you have a great time, and I hope the weather actually isn't isn't as hot as it's been uh, last couple of years. It's really becoming a big issue here in Greece. The the weather is just a little bit a little bit a little bit too hot for uh, even yeah. even in November even November, which is not great. Um, one last thing on running USA. Anything exciting we should be looking forward to? Uh, any peak we could have into new initiatives, things coming out, things you guys are working on. Yeah. So we have two research studies we're working on right now. One of them's in partnership with Marathon Photo, where they have some really cool technology that's able to identify shoes, the shoe brand of finishers of races that they photograph. So we're working with Marathon Photo to look at what are shoe preferences of individuals and in races uh, in the U.S. and around the country or around the world that, that Marathon Photo works with. And we'll be presenting that data at some of the upcoming conferences, including the running event in Austin, Texas. And then um, we'll probably be touching on it in both Athens and in England as well at those conferences. We also are, are working on a report right now looking at finish times. Um the Boston Marathon at changing their cutoff times really brought on what are what are times doing? Are people getting faster in all distances and all races? So we're going to be looking at finish times for 5Ks, 10Ks, half full marathons based on gender, based on age, based on a lot of different factors. So those will be coming out by the end of this calendar year. And then I'm really excited about what we're doing with conference, with our annual industry conference, which will be February 2nd through 4th um, in Louisville, Kentucky. So right here in my hometown, have a lot of great stuff planned for that industry conference. So it's one of those that you're not going to want to miss out on just great networking opportunities, but also some really cool educational sessions there. 
Awesome. You put your finger on the scale there to bring it to uh, to Louisville. Surprisingly, it had been chosen before I came in, but I think at some point I did. I used to work for the Louisville Sports Commission, and every year I would tell them, let's bid on hosting Running USA. Let's bid on it. And I left that organization in 2018, and it just took a few years for me to to finally – have my influence come back around where we're hosting it here in Kentucky. Oh, great. Short commute for you. Well, Michael, I want to thank you very, very much for your time. I'm sure listeners uh, drew lots of value from, from this great discussion, lots of highlights. If you want to download the full report, as Michael said, it's available to Running USA members. You can also purchase it at a price if you're not a Running USA member. And we look forward to all of the other uh, great reports you guys will be bringing out. So thank you very much for your time today. I hope you uh, enjoyed the discussion. Yes, thank you for having me. And and yes, we'll be in touch if you need us. Absolutely. Well, thanks again. And thanks to everyone listening in. And we'll see you guys on our next podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode on the 2024 Global Runner Survey with Running USA's Director of Operations, Michael Clemens. You can find more resources on anything and everything related to race directing on our website, racedirectorshq.com. You can also share your thoughts about some of the things discussed in today's episode or anything else in our Facebook group, Race Directors Hub. Many thanks again to our awesome podcast sponsors, Run Sign Up and Brooksy, for sponsoring today's episode. And if you'd like to learn more about these two amazing companies, head to runsignup.com, where you'll find just about everything you could possibly need to set up your race for success, including industry-leading registration tools, a professional free race website, free email marketing tools, and tons more. And don't forget to check out Brooksy's new innovative Laurel timing technology, giving you real-time tracking of participants and a virtual command center for your race by visiting brooksy.com forward slash headstart. That's brooksy, B-R-O-O-K-S-E dot com forward slash headstart, where you can also get a massive 50% off your first booking. Until our next episode, take care and keep putting on amazing races.